Over here. Hi class, welcome back to our poetry course. Uh, this is our first full lecture online. So we're going to be covering images and imagism today as we work our way through lecture. So today we're looking at elements of poetry and we're specifically looking at um, images and how do we create images. So one of the things that I think is really important when we're working in this form of po when we're working or we're focusing on this element of poetry is that we look at writing to our senses, right? Because how do we create the sense of an image when there's actually no physical image present? Well, we do that by writing to our senses. Writing strategy. So, and it's also probably the one that's most obvious in writing right? Um, but hearing loud, soft, yell, whisper, angry, and all kinds of other objectives, adjectives are used for sound. But have you ever thought about using something more personal? She spoke with a lover's voice. Not a cat's making me want to listen closely to every syllable. Right. And so it's evoking a sound. It's evoking a sense of a sound where we can hear what does a lover's voice sound like? Well, we can imagine that. Right. Um, he sounded like freedom. Whoa. He sounded like freedom. Beautiful powerful, strong, right? Uh, unbound, un, uninhibited. He sounded like freedom. Not just his words, but the way that they tumbled gently from his lips. Or use a little <laughs> synesthesia, uh, which synesthesia is when the mind mixes up sound and color, right? So we could we could sort of assign a specific color to a specific sound. It was a bright red noise repeating stop, stop continually until I just couldn't go on any longer. A bright red noise. Sight. This is also probably one of the most uh, utilized sense in uh, writing. Uh, the most often used sense when writing is sight. It's what we use most and what comes naturally to us. Write about what you see. But here's a tip. Look beyond what you just what others see. Blue sky, green grass, the details of color, shape, size to indicate something new. For example, the shamrock green of the open expanse curved around a small grove of trees, then down toward the river, right? It's, it's very descriptive that we get a sense of the location. We see setting, we feel setting right? Um, there's movement that's being recorded in our site, but then it's also that very sort of specific green. And this is, I found this picture, and for me, it's definitely that, that shamrock green that they're referring to, right? Curved down toward the river, curved down toward the river. Smell, right? And smell is actually the the longest forming uh, memory that we can create, right? We never forget what a smell is, right? It, it stays with us longer than any other memory. Um, so works that stink and works that stink and like, uh, whew, sorry, I'm having a hard time reading this right now. Uh, so works like, Stink and pungent are great 
to use, but words like stink. That's a typo. That's why I'm confused. Uh, so words like stink and pungent are great to use, but you can easily go deeper into explanation. For example, the alley smelled of urine and Cracker Jacks. Every time I read that, I always think about um, downtown Nashville, uh, Broadway. When you walk down the streets of Broadway, right, they smell like rivers of bachelorette vomit. Um, uh, but so we, we get a whole, we have this sort of, we can kind of picture where we are based off of the descriptions that's given to us here. The alley smelled of urine and Cracker Jacks and assault on to the nose and eyes alike, right? So perhaps we're somewhere near baseball stadium. You know, that, that we, we get that, that we can get that image from the word Cracker Jacks, right? It's all American snack. And then smell the urine and Cracker Jacks and assault on the nose and the eyes alike. Uh, the wind changed to something foul, dead, wafting up from the darkened pit. Wafting up from the darkened pit. Touch. So the way things feel is more than just the texture and the temperature. Like the other senses, it can be personal. His handshake was my father's handshake. Not like, not to meet you, but the rough callousness of someone showing you who's boss. Right? So his handshake was not like, was not to meet you. It's not to, to greet you. And nobody should be shaking hands right now, <laughs> right? Uh, but his handshake was not to meet you, right? It's not to be inviting. It's not to feel peaceful. His handshake was not to meet you but the rough callousness of someone. So here we're getting that sense of touch, right? Because his hands are rough and callous, right? That he's the, a man who works, right? So there's like that, that texture that's present in the skin already, but the rough callousness of someone showing you who's boss, which also gives us a sense of touch again, right? That it's a firm handshake, okay? Um, it felt like the memory of something long forgotten, thin, almost invisible, right? So what we're doing is we're giving um, something that's abstract, right? Memory. Memory isn't tangible. I can't hold that in my hand. I can't know what memory is, right? So here I'm, be, I'm looking... I'm, I'm, I'm giving memory something physical. I'm giving it something that's concrete. Sorry, this couch is really uncomfortable when you've been sitting in it, making lectures for forever. Uh, so, or try something like this. It, it felt like a memory of something long forgotten. Again, that memory is not concrete, so we're giving it something concrete right? We're giving it presence. We're giving it physical presence so that we can understand what the concept is, right? So thin, almost invisible. Something long forgotten. So what we're doing is we're taking memory and we're taking the act of reaching back into memory to discover a memory that was almost lost and forgotten. And we're doing that by saying thin, almost invisible. We're giving it a physical presence. We're like, we're rooting around for it. We're looking for it. Taste. Uh, and taste is something that, in my opinion, is really underutilized in poetry and in writing specifically, right? Taste is something that is different to each of us and is difficult to get across in a book, right? And we talked about this actually in our last lecture when we were talking about concrete versus um, concrete versus um, 
man, now words are, I'm forgetting how to use words. This is, this is not good right now. <laughs> uh, versus abstract, right? Where when we put that it tastes delicious versus it tastes sour. And we're going to get to that delicious taste later on in this lecture, right? But for me, delicious might taste like chocolate. It might taste like honey. It might taste sweet. It might taste um, earthy, right? I really, really love green juice. I've been drinking it since I was a little girl, right? And my, my best friend, when she drinks it, she tastes it and she goes, uh, it just tastes too earthy. Well, I guess I like I like that sort of taste, but that might be delicious to me, right? Um, whereas with um, whereas you know, sour is tangible. Sour is understandable. Sour might be delicious to some people, right? But it's specific where, it's specific where I understand what that taste is. I can almost taste it in my mouth when I'm talking about it. Um, here we have uh, the undercooked bacon felt like a wet sponge placed on my tongue. Only grease leaked into my mouth instead of water. <laughs> Right I'm still like relatively new to the world of meat eating. Um, so this always really freaks me out. But right, so it's that sort of that limpness is present that we're getting the sense of what it tastes like. Um, here I like, like hot cocoa on a winter morning, the dinner calmed and relaxed me. Right. And so we're using hot cocoa to refer to the dinner that calmed and relaxed me. But so there's this like familiarity that hot cocoa gives us. There's this um, sort of peace, that stillness too of winter that we associate when we're drinking hot chocolate, um, that it is, it is still, it is peaceful, it is calm, and we're not sort of fighting to understand um, or to get through the dinner. Um, and so now we're going to do this probably throughout our lectures where I'm going to have uh, journal writing projects for you. So you should go ahead and take out your journal right now because we're going to do some in-class poetry writing. So I'm going to show you a series of images. Um, and then I also have sounds that will go along with it. And what I want you to do is I want you to write a poem inspired by each of the images, right? Um, and so I'm going to set a timer. We're going to do this for quite, for a couple of minutes for each image. And so just really sit there, maybe even, you know, turn a couple of the lights down low, try and really get engaged in the images that you're about to see on the screen. And um, yeah, we're going to write some poems. You can do this in any style that you want to do them in. I'm not assigning a form with them because I want you more. I don't want you to start using, I don't want you to have form stand in the way of the image that we're about to see. Okay. So instead just immerse yourself as much as you can in what's, what you see, what you hear, imagine what you smell, Imagine what you would touch. Imagine the temperature and the environment, right? Um, and just really sort of allow yourself to get lost in the images that are going to be on the screen. So... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, good job, class. Um, so I want you to, in between each of these, just kind of take a little break, okay? Um, take a deep breath. We've got a couple more of these writing exercises to do. So just sort of center yourself, pause for a minute. You can breathe in. Follow the GIF, right? Um, and now we're gonna get into our next, our next image.
I know it's hard to return to quarantine reality after that last picture, but come back, maybe stretch your hand, pop your knuckles, you know, relax your shoulders, take a deep breath, and we're going to begin our next writing to our senses exercise. And remember, too, that we're writing about what we see and hear, yes, very much, but also what I want you to do is also envision smell and taste. And unfortunately, I I usually do bring in one that's smell-specific. I, I just can't I can't bring smell through the computer for this one, but we are going to do one exercise that focuses primarily on taste This uh, for this lecture, okay? So just take a break, and now we're going to move on to our next slide. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, take another breather. Deep breath in and out, right? Uh, I didn't even think about how anxiety inducing that last one could be, especially with our current situation, but um, you could definitely write some really beautiful poetry after having looked at um, that last slide. Right, so pause. Feel free to pause the presentation if you need to and move around a little bit and then come back and we'll begin our next one.
Really good job. Okay, there's one more of these. So relax, right? And if you're getting stressed out about this, just remind yourself that all you're doing is sitting around writing poems in your house, trying to relax and, you know, you know, be f allow yourself a little bit of freedom while we do this, right? There's a lot going on right now. And I think that doing these exercises is really going to be helpful and it's going to be important. What it is, is it's an installation and sculpture series done by uh, Antony, Antony uh, called Lick and Lather. And so Lick and Lather comprises 14 self-portrait busts that Janine Antony cast in two materials with seven in chocolate and seven in soap. So each cast was identical until the ar artist undertook the task of licking the chocolate bus and bathing with the soap busts, hence the playful title, Lick and Lather. Antony's labor is making the work resulted in two sets of 14, seven autonomous soap chocolate pairs and the gallery's 14 busts. The number seven is significant for it represents the average number of heads measuring a full female figure, a metric used in drawing classes. In this sculpture, the artist's self-effacing erasure differentiates her self-portrait from herself. Uh, thus, Lick and Lather reflects on the inherent nature of cast sculptures as a reproductive median. It also riffs on the idealizing representation in classical sculptures, which over time have become worn. Materially, the chocolate has a texture uh, akin to bronze, while the soap busts are smooth, resembling a cross between marble and wax. And so what I want you to do before we get into this is I want you to go and try and find a piece of chocolate. And I pray to God you have chocolate at your house during this time. Um, I want you to wash your hands really, really good, right? It's where the sell smell of that soap is on your hands. And then I want you to eat a piece of chocolate while we look at this art series. And I want you to write a poem, any poem that comes to your mind after we've had this experience together. This is our last one. So really take a break if you need a break. Come back to this if you need to, or let's just dive head on into the wreck.
I hope you enjoyed that. It can be sort of like a little break away from all the chaos. <sighs> and so now, um, if you'd like, you can sort of divide this lecture up into two and there's like a nice natural break that we can take right now. Or if you're somebody that just likes to dive in, uh, Imagism is a popular, is a, a movement that's associated with modernism. Um, and we've talked about modernism a lot. And I think it's really funny that in all of my classes, we're sort of coming to modernism at this time because I feel that there's a really strong connection that we can make uh, with our current situation and with modernist writers. The fact that the last time that we had um, a worldwide pandemic that's rel like similar, not not nearly to the scale. I mean, it's far. It was far greater than the scale of what we're seeing now with COVID nineteen. But um, that was probably the last time that I think we could say that we, as a as a, a global society, had to declare a pandemic. Um, so essentially, a lot of what the modernist writers are doing is they're they're living in a time called the age of anxiety. World War One has happened, um, and if any of you are bored while you're quarantined, I, I suggest going and watching the movie 1917. Uh, we see very few movies made about uh, this about World War One because it was so horrific. Um, and they do a pretty decent job of capturing that sort of fear and anxiety that you, that also the, the inhumanity that really is um, what World War I is known for. Um, but so we're coming out of World War I and what modernist writers are doing is how I like to think of a modernism is to think of a blank canvas. And so what the modernist writers do is that they look at the canvas, they see that it is blank, and they create something new on it. They make it beautiful. They fill the canvas. Uh, they're often sort of trying to leave behind uh, rules and traditions and instead to reevaluate and create art to help either avoid having to deal with that anxi internal anxiety or to hide that sort of hollow emptiness that we're seeing. Um, and so images poetry is poetry that is done to capture the natural image of a moment, right? Uh, one of my favorite images poems is uh, Anecdote in a Jar by Wallace Stevens. So I placed a jar in Tennessee, and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild. The jar was round upon the ground and tall and of a port in air. It took dominion everywhere. The jar was gray and bare. It did not give of bird or bush like nothing else in Tennessee. So if we're going to just analyze this poem, you know, we're going to explicate this poem. Uh, Stevens, 
a lot of the way that I read this poem is as an understanding of the influence that language has on our perception of reality. A lot of other students read it sort of with eco-criticism in mind, right? That man's invasion of the wilderness has this impact on the jar. Um, but if we look, and I'm trying to find my cursor. Here it is, right? If we look, I placed a jar in Tennessee and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. And slovenly means dirty, chaotic, unkempt, unruly, right? And so it made this sort of natural, disorderly wilderness have order, right? That it tames the wildness, the naturalness of the wilderness. Because I placed a jar in Tennessee and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. So now it's patterned because now everything is sort of dependent on the placement of the jar. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild because it's, it's, it's been contained, right? And again, it's why I read this as sort of the understanding of the influence that language has on, on us. Because once I give it a word, I control that sensation. Right? No longer wild. And then because Stevens is so masterful, right? And we're going to get into um, preface to some images. Um, images poetry by in here in a minute, which was our poetic theory essay, right? But we have this sort of um, natural speech. He's definitely using enjambment, right? Which is where the the line is not finished, right? It might it it depends on the line below. It's not a complete thought. Um, but there's a naturalness to the speech, to the verses above. And then we get to hear the wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild. The jar was round upon the ground. That's an internal rhyme, right? Um, and it's a very sort of sing-song rhyme too, um, basic rhyme. All of a sudden the language becomes patterned an unnatural speech because the jar has taken away that naturalness. The jar was round upon the ground and tall and of a port in air. So first, tall and of a port in air. It sounds like the air of importance, right? That it 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 claimed all attention. It 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 controlled all things and then it took dominion everywhere and again air and everywhere rhyme right brandon i'm looking at you you're my rhyme guy right uh you for some reason my webcam stopped working and i was gonna come back and like look at you guys and like you know, make my strange faces, but you know, technology <laughs> uh, failed me again. So it's new. Um, but right that we and tall and of a port and air, tall and of an air and of importance. But that's also the jar, right? Because the jar is empty, as we see later on, right? But tall and of a port and air. There's nothing inside of the jar. It's hollow. It took dominion everywhere. The jar was gray and bare. The jar is lifeless. The jar is empty. It did not give or bur of bird or bush. We're coming back, right? We're still talking about the jar, but we're coming back to a, a somewhat natural pattern of speech, right? Our speaker is becoming more natural again, but we still have that use of alliteration. It did not give of bird or bush. 
like nothing else in Tennessee. And when we come back to Tennessee, when we come back to the wilderness, that's when we become natural again. Oh, one of my favorite poems of all time, right? Some of you have taken me before. I'm sure you're tired of me talking about this poem, but I'm never going to get over this poem. So sorry, not sorry. Uh, and two, I think it's like really something beautiful that we can hang on to here in Tennessee. We're all becoming very isolated and sort of alone. But, oh, there's so much natural beauty in Tennessee, right? Um, and every time I read this poem, it just makes me want to go jump in a waterfall, <laughs> a Tennessee waterfall. Um, but so now let's look at the preface to some imagists. Uh, she lays out, I think it's seven guidelines for what good imagist poetry should be. So the first one is, one, to use the language of common speech, but to employ always the exact word, not the nearly exact, nor the merely decorative word. So there, it's the economy of language that we talk about all the time, that every word in an image's poem is working towards something. There's nothing in the poem that is unnecessary. It's all there to, to support the poem. And that each word is having to do exactly what it needs to do. Um, and so when we see words again, like slovenly, right? Slovenly was the word that that needed to be, right? That there would be no other word that could make up for it. So think about in our last lecture when we talked about word choice, the difference between the right word and the wrong word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug, right? That we have to make sure that we're being very specific and purposeful with our language. To create new rhythms as the expression of new moods. New modes, smart, smart moods. Uh, and not to copy old rhythms, which merely echo old moods. We do not insist on free verse as the only method of writing poetry. We fight for it as the principle of liberty. We believe that individuality uh, of a poet may often be better expressed in free, free verse than in conventional forms. In poetry, a new cadence means a new idea. So again, right, we're, in, we're coming into this new genre, right? Ezra Pound cry, cries for the new, to make it new. Um, and so that's a big part of what we're doing in Images Poetry is that we're trying to reinvent. We're trying to embrace new. We're not being, again, form is not, does not come before sensation and said sensation comes before form. We're freeing ourselves in a sense. To allow absolute freedom in the choice of subject. Is this not good art to write badly about airplanes and automobiles, nor is it necessarily bad art to write well about the past? We believe passionately in the artistic value of modern life, but we wish to point out that there is nothing so uninspiring nor as old fashioned as an aeroplane of the year 1911. Um, so a big part of modernism is, is a movement called neoclassism. So we're revisiting these sort of ancient or these sort of older storylines, but we're reimagining them to become modern. Um, and we're, we're looking at them and we're recreating them, right? Um, so it's not wrong to write about the past. It would just be, it wouldn't be natural to write about the past in the same style that we wrote about the past. If that can kind of make sense. It kind of, that's not really confusing, but whatevs, you know, uh, to present an image 
hence the name Imagist. We are not a school of painters, but we believe that poetry should render particulars exactly and not deal with vague generalities. However, magnificent and sonorous. It is for this reason that we oppose the cosmic poet who seems to us to shirk the real difficulties of art. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create the sense of the image or the sense of the poem and not to stand in the way of the poem itself. We're trying to impart and create as truly, as naturally, as honestly, and as effectively the image itself. To produce poetry that is hard and clear, never blurred nor indefinite. Um, so again, you know, when a lot of students, when they first read the anecdote in a jar, they're like, oh my God, Ms. Lear, are you seriously making us read this poem about a jar? And I'm like, yeah, I am, right? But it's not difficult to understand. It's not difficult to comprehend. Hold on here. Got to get this situation handled now. Whew. Right? But instead, it's there's some, it shouldn't be hard to, it shouldn't be difficult. To read in its what in itself. But it might be difficult to read. On another level. To produce poetry that is hard and clear, right? I like the way that it's said there. Never blurred nor indefinite. It's specific. It's true in a sense of whatever true could mean. Hard and clear. Not plainly wouldn't work well there, right? Instead, it's... it's there's depth, but yet it's that it's it's clear. Well, yeah. Finally, most of us believe that the concentration is of the very essence of poetry. Concentration is of the very essence of poetry. Uh, so it's not always only sentimental, right? It's not always sort of ethereal. It's not always uh, easy to distinguish because we are working toward, we're working in a medium that's failed already, right? A poetry written that evokes pictures or images for the reader is direct presentation of images or word pictures. Word choice is specific. Adjectives are used to enhance the specificity of word choice, but they are not overused. And then lastly, to attempt to freeze a single moment in time and capture the emotions of that moment. And so here we are. This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox in which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet, and so cold. <laughs> Uh, William Carlos Williams, this, I believe that he, it was stated that this was a found poem, and so he's collecting these different sorts of um, lines that he's seeing left on notes. Um, but, but what he's doing in this poem is he's 
it's plain and simple, just like we just went over, right? I have eaten the plums that were in the ice box. So we know that our speaker is past tense, right? I have eaten, but this action has already come. And then the plums that were in the ice box. So the plums that you were saving for a later occasion in which you, and we get to that in the third stanza, right? I mean, in the middle stanza, second stanza, in which you were probably saving for breakfast. The ones that you were saving, probably too. So we're seeing too intent already. The speaker is aware <laughs> of, he's sort of pacifying his actions in a sense, right? Um, you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious. So sweet and so cold. Um, there's a playfulness with intimacy and uh, betrayal that's going on in the poem, right? And there's the appearance of an apology, but there's not really an appearance of an apology. And whenever we think of a plum, plums are always, uh, plums and peaches often represent sensuality, right? We should all be very familiar with this, especially those of you who like to send text messages, right? We know that the peach emoji means something that's not just a peach. <laughs> I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox in which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. Right. And so we see that maybe there's the beginning of an apology, but then he's not sad at all. Right. The speaker is not sad at all. Forgive me. They were delicious. So sweet. And so cold. Oh. Right. Um, so we see the sort of disingenuous uh, apology from the speaker. He's not sorry. He knows that he has betrayed a certain level of trust. Um, and perhaps maybe he's even tasted, tasted the forbidden fruit. Right. Um, and again, you know, if you think about plums, if you've ever, when you have a really good plum, that's something that just stands out to you. So again, it's it's the perfect image to the use of the symbol, the fruit, right? Uh, it's one of my, it's one of the more interesting, I, I, I mean, all of William Carlos Williams' poems are interesting, but this one is one that I really enjoy. Uh, and we're going to lastly look at concrete poetry. So concrete poetry is an arrangement of linguistic elements in which the typographical effect is more important in the conveying meaning than the verbal si significance. It is sometimes referred to as a visual poetry. Um, and so this is actually the oldest example of concrete poetry that we have. It's Easter wings, right? And so the poem is written in a way that looks like wings, right? Um, but we're going to look at Swan and Shadow by John Hollander. Dusk above the water hang the loud flies. Here, oh so gray, then what? A pale signal will appear when 
soon before its shadow fades, where here in this pool of opened eye in us, no, upon us, as at very at the at the very edge, this object bears its image awakening, ripples of recognition that will brush darkness up into light. Even after this bird, this hour doth drift by atop the perfect sad instant now, already passing out of sight toward yet untroubled reflection, this image bears its object darkening into memorial shades, scattered bits of light, no of water or something across water, breaking up, no having gathered soon, yet by then a swan will have gone, yes, out of the mind into what vast pale hush of a place past sudden dark, as if a swan sang. Um, and so the poem, what the poem is getting at is that it's only for this brief moment when the beautiful image of the swan perfectly reflected in shadow can exist because the swan will move and time will move. And then our memory of the swan at this moment of perfect, perfect reflection will in itself move and bend and fade out into obscurity. Just as the shadow is an obscured reflection of the swan, So, I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful week. And I will see you next class. Uh, and our next class will feature a lecture between myself and Joe Kane. So, be safe, be smart, be all the things that you need to be. And I will see you soon. Bye.